Chapter 1 Introduction to Educational Research The purpose of Chapter 1 is to provide an overview of educational research and introduce you to some important terms and concepts. My discussion in this set of lecture will usually center around the same headings that are used in the book chapters. You might want to have your book open as you go through the lectures. My goal is to have you better understand the material in the book. However, you should not consider these lectures to be comprehensive. You will still need to spend a good deal of time outlining your text and creating concept maps or other organizational schema to fully comprehend the entire text. Here are a few reasons to take this course and learn about educational research. First, it is important to become research literate because we live in a society that is driven by research. Next, you need to improve your critical thinking skills. Improving your critical thinking skills allows you to learn how to read and critically evaluate published research. And finally, to learn how to design and conduct research in case the need arises one day. There are many areas in educational research. Open your book to pages 6 to 7 and look at Table 1.1. There are 12 major divisions in our largest association, and there are many special interest groups, abbreviated SIGs. Do you see any of areas that are of interest to you? To learn more about the areas of educational research and the current issues, I recommend that you explore the AERA website at http aera.net. By the way, the AERA has great student membership rates. In the next section of this lecture, we will discuss five general kinds of research. Basic research, applied research, evaluation research, action research, and orientational research. Basic research is research aimed at generating fundamental knowledge and theoretical understanding about basic human and other natural processes. Applied research is focused on answering practical questions to provide relatively immediate solutions. Basic and applied research can be viewed as two endpoints on a research continuum, with the center representing the idea that research can be applied research can contribute to basic research and vice versa. Here's the continuum. Evaluation research involves determining the worth, merit, or quality of an evaluation object. Evaluation is traditionally classified according to its purpose. Formative evaluation is used for the purpose of program improvement, while summative evaluation is used for the purpose of making summary judgments about a program and decisions to continue or discontinue that program. A newer and currently popular way to classify evaluation is to divide it into five types. Needs assessments answers the question, is there a need for this type of program? Theory assessment asks the question, is this program conceptualized in a way that it should work? Implementation assessment asks, was this program implemented properly and according to the program plan? Impact assessment which asks, did this program have an impact on its intended targets? And efficiency of assessment, which asks, is this program cost effective? Action research focuses on solving practitioners' local problems. It is generally conducted by the practitioners after they have learned about the methods of research and research concepts that are discussed in your textbook. It is important to understand that action research is also a state of mind. For example, teachers who are action researchers are constantly observing their students for patterns 
and thinking about ways to improve instruction, classroom management, and so forth. Orientational research is done for the purpose of advancing an ideological position. It is traditionally called critical theory. We use the broader term orientational research because critical theory was originally concerned only with class inequalities and was based on Karl Marx's theories of economics, society, and revolution. Orientational research is focused on some form of inequality, discrimination, or stratification in society. Some areas in which inequality manifests itself are large differences in income, wealth, access to high-quality education, power, and occupation. Here are some major areas of interest to orientational researchers. Class stratification, that is, inequality resulting from one's economic class in society. Gender stratification, that is, inequality resulting from one's gender. Ethnic and racial stratification, that is, inequality resulting from one's ethnic or racial grouping. Sexual orientational stratification, inequality and discrimination based on one's sexual preferences. Disability stratifications, inequalities and discriminations based on someone's physical or mental disability. National and international inequalities, that is, or for example, wealthy nations versus developing nations. Many orientational researchers work for universities or interest group organizations. In this next section, we discuss how people learn about the world around them and gain knowledge. The two major ways we learn are through experience and reasoning. The idea here is that knowledge comes from experience. Historically, this view was called empiricism. The term empirical literally means based on observation, experiment, or experience. The next source of knowledge is simply called reasoning. Historically, this idea was called rationalism. That is, original knowledge comes from thought and reasoning. There are two main forms of reasoning. Deductive reasoning, that is the process of drawing a conclusion that is necessarily true if premises are true. Deductive reasoning is the classical approach used by the great rationalists in the history of Western civilization. And inductive reasoning, that is the process of drawing a conclusion that is probably true. The so-called problem of induction is that the future might not resemble the present, which is a major reason why we don't get quote-unquote proof in empirical research. Science is also an approach for the generation of knowledge. It relies on a mixture of empiricism, that is the collection of data, and rationalism, that is the use of reasoning and theory construction and testing. Science has many distinguishing characteristics. First, science is progressive. In other words, we stand on the shoulders of giants. That's a quote by Newton. Next, science is rational. Science is creative, dynamic. Science is open. Science is critical. And science is never ending. In order to do science, we usually make several assumptions. They're summarized in Table 1.3 of your text. The first assumption states that there is a world that can be studied. And this includes studying the inner worlds of individuals, things that you may not necessarily be able to see or experience yourself. Assumption 2. Some of the world is unique. Some of it is regular, patterned, or predictable and much of it is dynamic and complex. This assumption covers the basis that what we get out of educational research isn't necessarily something that we can say, I've proven this to be true, because there's just too many things that 
play a role in whether the, uh, the educational research can be generalized to larger populations. Third, the unique, the regular, and the complex in the world can all be examined and studied by researchers. Fourth, researchers should try to follow certain agreed-on norms and practices. We'll spend a good deal of this course talking about what those norms and practices are. Fifth, it is possible to distinguish between more and less plausible claims and between good and poor research. One of the main objectives of this course, in my opinion, is to make it so that you are a critical reader of educational research and no longer fall prey to some administrator or colleagues simply stating, well, the research says, without ever actually reading it yourself. And finally, six, science can't provide all the answers. Sometimes we just don't know why something happened the way it did. There are many scientific methods. The two major methods are the inductive method and the deductive method. The confirmatory or deductive method involves the following three steps. First, state the hypothesis. This hypothesis should be based on theory or the existing literature around the particular topic. After stating the hypothesis, you should deduce what must be observed to state that the hypothesis is true? The second step is to actually collect data. That's the empirical part of this. Collect data to test the hypothesis. Then, looking at those data, make a decision to tentatively accept or reject the hypothesis. Keep in mind, researchers still don't claim they've quote-unquote proven any hypothesis, just that based on the data available, there is evidence to support or refute the stated hypothesis. Confirmatory methods are commonly used by quantitative researchers. The exploratory or inductive method is the second approach, and it also involves three steps. They're very different steps, though. In the first step, the researcher simply observes the world, or the environment, or the phenomenon, or the situation, whatever it is that you define as your world for the research. Then the researcher searches for patterns in what he or she observed. Finally, the researcher makes a generalization or con conclusion about what is occurring based off of the rationalization of all the things he or she observed and patterns he or she found. Exploratory methods are commonly used by qualitative research. Let's look further at the differences between the confirmatory method and the exploratory method. The confirmatory method is a top-down, or theory to hypothesis testing approach to research. It is used most by quantitative researchers. They state their hypotheses, make predictions about what must occur if a hypothesis is supported, and what will happen if the hypothesis is to be rejected, collect data, analyze the data, and draw a conclusion. The conclusion being whether the hypothesis is supported or the hypothesis is rejected. In contrast, the exploratory method is a bottom-up, or theory generation approach to research. It is used by many qualitative researchers. They enter the field with no predetermined theory and learn from what they see. They start with the particulars, the many things they see in the world, and develop descriptions of what they see, and sometimes they develop theories based on what they see and observe. Virtually any application of science includes the use of both the confirmatory deductive and the exploratory inductive approaches to the scientific method, either in a single study or over time. This idea is demonstrated in Figure 1.1. The exploratory or inductive method is the bottom-up method that is especially useful for generating theories and hypotheses. 
The confirmatory or deductive method is a top-down method that is especially useful for testing theories and hypotheses. The word theory most simply means explanation. Theories explain how and why something operates as it does. Some theories are highly developed and encompass a large terrain, that is, big theories or grand theories. <laughs> Other theories are smaller theories or briefer explanations. The authors summarize the key criteria to use in evaluating a theory in Table 1.4 of your text. According to the principle of evidence, what is gained in empirical research is evidence, not proof. This means that knowledge based on educational research is ultimately tentative. Therefore, please eliminate the word proof from your vocabulary when you talk about research results. Empirical research provides evidence. It does not provide proof. Also note that Evidence increases when a finding has been replicated. Hence, you should not draw firm conclusions from a single research study. There are five major objectives of educational research. The first is called exploration. Exploration is done when you are trying to generate ideas about something. The second type is description. This is done when you want to describe the characteristics of something or some phenomenon. The third type is called explanation. This is done when you want to show how and why a phenomenon operates as it does. If you are interested in causality, cause-effect, you are interested in explanation. Fourth version is prediction. This is your objective when your primary interest is in making accurate predictions. Note, the advanced sciences make much more accurate predictions than newer social and behavioral sciences. And the fifth type is called influence or control. The objective of this type of research is a little different. It involves the application of research results to impact the world. A demonstration program is an example of influence. One convenient and useful way to classify research is into exploratory research, descriptive research, explanatory research, predictive research, and demonstration research. Now that you've had an overview of Chapter 1, take some time and go back through the chapter, become comfortable with all of the terminology, and try to answer the review questions located within the text. If you go onto the student site, which is given here on this URL, you can have access to all of the answers to those questions. There's also a convenient practice quiz and some other ancillary information that could help you with this chapter. This presentation was built using the original PowerPoint presentation and lecture notes provided by authors Johnson and Christensen on the instructor and student websites which accompany the fourth edition of Educational Research, Quantitative, Qualitative, and Mixed Approaches. I have modified the slide content and script to match our needs, but the original content is copyrighted by Sage Publication.